It is indeed a day of infamy. In a dream, you see your home. Bustling streets filled with people going to and from everywhere. Cars zipping past one another, kids laughing with each other, and over it all looms a familiar sight. A structure, a monument as beautiful as it is iconic. The centerpiece of this city, no, this empire state. But as soon as it came, your dream ended as you awoke to a new sound. A chorus of sorts that's drown out the familiar symphony of the streets you once knew. This new tone stripped your home of its vibrance. All innocence and justice has been removed, and in their place is only red. The chaotic bustle of the streets was exchanged for a metronome of combat boots, and in truth, the real city that never sleeps can now only be found in your sleep. Will you let this red wave continue and wash over your memories, or will you take up arms and fight to make that dream a reality once again? Well, in 2003, IO Interactive, the creators of titles like Hitman and Kane and Lynch, let you find out when they released the absolute classic, Freedom Fighters. In Freedom Fighters, an alternate history has played out where in World War II, the Soviet Union discovered the nuclear bomb instead of America. Such a huge shift in the balance of power led this timeline's version of the Soviets to begin taking all of Europe into his Iron Curtain, one nation at a time. Fast forward to the modern day, and the United States is left near alone as the only holdout against the Red Wave. You take the place of Christopher Stone, a plumber working in New York City alongside his brother on the day of the invasion. On a routine job in a Manhattan apartment, your journey begins when a group of armed soldiers burst in the door and surround your brother, demanding to know the whereabouts of the owner of this house, who they claim is a prominent anti-Soviet movement leader. Despite his protests and denial of any knowledge regarding this, the soldiers drag your brother out of the house and arrest him for further questioning. Managing to escape detection through all this, you come out of hiding only to see what looks like attack helicopters and battalions of tanks out the window, now roaming the streets of New York. It would seem the day has come. The Soviet Union has invaded. If you're going to get your brother back and fix this mess, you're going to need help, and the first place to start will be to find this movement leader that got your brother arrested. This marks the start of your 10 or so hour journey from a plumber to a freedom fighter that'll take you from skyscraper highs to metro tunnel lows and to every corner of the Big Apple in order to save your family and home. The story in Freedom Fighters is what I would call fairly simplistic, but somehow it manages to be great despite that. This is no Witcher 3 with hours of dialogue choices and branching paths. Instead, IO Interactive went a similar route to games like Half-Life 2, where the story is told more through exploration of your unique setting than through reading books and having deep conversations. You'll learn about the world by tuning into news broadcasts and exploring the streets of New York City. It's here where you'll come to find that the real main character of this story is the city itself. Seeing the seasons change and the streets get more and more war-torn over time was jaw-dropping and really added to the atmosphere as a whole. The levels got progressively more impressive as the game went on too, seeing you take on massive battles in places like movie theaters, TV studios, downtown Manhattan, and even at the Statue of Liberty. One thing a lot of developers don't seem to realize is that level design can make or break a game alone, and in Freedom Fighters, it was the star of the show. That's not to say that there's no personal moments in the story, however. Freedom Fighters used its few main characters extremely well and played into the patriotic feeling of it all perfectly. Some shots and big moments were clearly made to resemble famous scenes like George Washington's Crossing the Delaware. Not only that, but there were some amazing speeches given from characters on both sides of the conflict that really got you hyped and excited about your accomplishments and the levels to come. Overall, I'd say the story was surprisingly gripping despite it not being the focus of this title, and it's fair to say that it left a real lasting impression with me by the end. Next, we'll get onto the combat, and again, like the story, I think the combat is deceptively simple here. In reality, the entirety of these encounters center completely around a basic arsenal of 10 standard weapons in a couple of pistols, an AR and submachine gun, a shotgun, light machine gun, sniper rifle, rocket launcher, and some grenades. The enemies begin to introduce a new layer of variety in the encounters though, as they come in many forms ranging from agile spec ops units that can dodge incoming attacks, to a tanky juggernaut armed with a light machine gun to mow down his foes. What begins to make Freedom Fighters unique, however, is that enemies will be set up in fortified checkpoints or strongholds, which especially on the harder difficulties will prove extremely challenging to take head on. 
To get past these, you'll have to either perfectly use your tools like covering grenades, or take one of the cleverly hidden side routes to be able to flank enemy machine gun turrets and watchtowers. Not only this, but at times your foes will also have attack helicopters or a tank for support, stacking the odds against you even more. It honestly took some time for me to adjust to the playstyle of this game after coming from more modern run and gun type shooters. On the harder difficulties at least, you're forced to think about every encounter before rushing in. What gun will you use? How much ammo do you have? And what enemies and vehicles will you have to take on? Without properly considering all this, you can get absolutely decimated time after time. It's only when you embrace the flow of the game and make use of all its back alleys, weapon types, and ally mechanics that you'll get through alive. Once you get the hang of the combat though, it's an absolute blast. It literally never got old, trying out new ways to take on specific encounters, and the sight of lead flying and explosions ringing while entire streets full of people battled was honestly awe-inspiring at times. Now I mentioned ally mechanics a second ago, and I wanted to touch back on that quickly. See, one of the more noteworthy mechanics in the game is the ability to recruit rebels to fight alongside you. As you progress through the game and complete side objectives, you'll gain charisma levels. Each time you increase to the next level, you'll gain the ability to have one additional follower tag along with you. In combat, these troops can be invaluable, as they'll draw fire from you and take on enemies with you too. You can use defend, attack, or follow me commands to order them around, and if downed, you can use medkits to revive them too. All in all, I thought this was a really cool mechanic, as it added to the scale of battles and really made you feel like you were assembling a little militia on the streets to fight your occupiers. Even without being recruited, you can find these rebels on the streets getting into their own gunfights with enemies, making the conflict feel that much more real. The AI also works pretty seamlessly with these guys, as they're able to keep up with you no matter where you go, and they follow instructions to a T most of the time. The enemy AI, on the other hand, can be a bit suspect at times. For the most part in combat, they serve as great opponents, but in moments when you're asked to be stealthy, their weird collision detection and pathfinding can lead to some issues like in this clip. Usually, stealthy games rely on predictable enemies with set paths. And while I got the feeling the devs tried to make this happen in Freedom Fighters, it really just seemed like it wasn't completely working in the game. Groups of enemies would literally watch every single path through an area, not moving to leave an opening for you. And since you're given no silent weapons to take out foes from a range, I was forced to rely on glitches like the one I just showed to get past these sections. It also seemed like there was nearly no punishment for not being stealthy too, despite an entire level being made for it, and the main characters telling you specifically to not be seen. All in all, this was a minor gripe though, as the vast majority of the game was more focused on head-to-head -head action than this mediocre stealth. The next thing I wanted to mention when it comes to issues is the checkpoint system. Seeing as this game is around 20 years old, it's not much of a surprise to find out that there is no quick save implemented, or even a way to save via the menus. In order to save the game, you must reach and open one of the few manholes scattered throughout the levels. If you don't save at one of these, you can be set back to the beginning of the entire mission when you die. This brochure added some frustration and difficulty to the missions that I felt was kind of unnecessary. Again, like I said earlier, this can take a bit of adjusting to if you're used to more modern games. As with that and the lack of recharging health, you can for sure come up against some tough situations. Luckily, IO Interactive was fairly generous with health packs, and outside of one level, usually place these manholes in fair enough locations where if used correctly, you shouldn't have too many setbacks. Alright, next, we're moving on to talking about the objectives in the game, and how the levels and worlds are structured around them. Before each level in Freedom Fighters, you'll generally start at your Rebel home base in the sewers, as it's via these sewers that the Rebels have access to all of New York through the manholes I mentioned earlier, allowing you to spring up anywhere for an attack at a moment's notice. In this home base though, you get to talk with other prominent Rebels, resupply weapons and ammo, and plan your next attacks on the map before you strike. You'll generally be given three or four levels to choose to play in any order at a time on this map, but with one of them acting as the main objective and the others as the side targets. On these levels, your main goal will be to forcefully take over a specific landmark or building and raise the American flag back over it, thus claiming control of the area. 
Outside of this is where Freedom Fighter starts to get really interesting though, as each of these separate levels you may select will actually affect one another in a bunch of interesting ways. One level may have an attack chopper hangar that provides air support to the others. Another level may have a troop barracks that gives reinforcements to the others, and if you take out one of these targets, the Soviets will lose that resource on the other maps, making them easier to take on. This means that you can attack any level head-on with no prior planning, but to do so means that you'll face massive resistance. On the contrary, you could slowly whittle down their supply lines via coordinated attacks on their resources, giving you a much stronger position going into the final level. On top of this, there'll be other side objectives to do, usually revolving around healing injured civilians or freeing prisoners of war. All of these side objectives strengthen you not just because they weaken the Soviets, but also because they provide you with charisma points that'll allow you to recruit more and more soldiers at a time. These side objectives really added depth to each level, and an extra layer of planning to the way you approach the game. Not only that, but they truly give you the feeling of being a freedom fighter, as they play perfectly into the narrative at hand. With each person you help and each Soviet you take down, the people of New York gain more confidence in you, and more hope for their freedom. By the end, you'll have a small army following you around, and this really allows you to see firsthand the effects of your hard work. Every system in this game works so well together and builds on one another to make such a refined and epic experience that it's no wonder that nearly everyone who's tried it is desperate for a sequel. If all that wasn't enough, IO Interactive managed to get one of the most prolific music producers in the video game industry to make a fantastic soundtrack backing all this up too. Jesper Kidd, the creator of music behind games like Assassin's Creed, Hitman, Borderlands the pre-sequel, and more, knocked this one out of the ballpark. He managed to mix traditional style Russian or Soviet sounding music with some electronic and bassy twists that combine into something that I can't say I've really heard before. Charging through the snow-filled streets of Manhattan with missiles flying past, choppers overhead, and this soundtrack roaring is just exhilarating and leaves you craving more constantly. A couple tracks I really liked were The Battle for Freedom, which played during the intro, and March of the Empire. Well folks, as you can probably tell, I really liked this game. It had such a unique take on the shooter genre and was so well made that I am shocked no developers have really tried to emulate it since. The base campaign alone was fantastic, and the developers even threw in an extra level after you beat it on hard where you can join the battle for what's left of the Statue of Liberty. IO Interactive really made a classic that stood the test of time here, and I recommend any fans of the shooter genre to try this game out. For all these reasons and more, I'm giving Freedom Fighters an 8.5 out of 10. Anyway, when I couldn't pinpoint the exact location of my humble summer cottage in the Hamptons, she dropped me right there. Cold. Damn, I look like an idiot still holding the drinks I'd been paying for all night. Well, who cares? You know, her loss. Hey, pop the clutch. Let's get on with it. <laughs>